Welcome everyone to the second year of our Templeton project uh, on space and time after quantum gravity and the talk that it funds, the speaker series that it funds. Uh, we start this year with uh, Josh Norton who comes to us from the American University in Beirut. Josh has done his undergraduate degree at the University of California in San Diego uh, and I believe we overlapped for, yeah. was it one year? Uh, when I was uh, there as a young assistant professor and you were just finishing your undergraduate and then he went to uh, the University of Illinois in Chicago where he did his PhD in 2015 and at which point he moved then to uh, Beirut to take up an assistant professorship there. Uh, Josh works on philosophy of physics, philosophy of quantum gravity and the metaphysical issues in connection to that. He has two papers uh, in the two best journals uh, in philosophy of science, one in the British Journal for Philosophy of Science and one in philosophy of science and has a number of talks and other activities. I'm not going to go into a long introduction here, but I'm very happy to welcome Josh here to Geneva and start this year with incubating a future metaphysics. Um, please. Thank Josh. you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, good to see those of you in uh, Chicago. Though I can't see who you are yet, I guess during the question time I'll know who's there and I'll thank you again. I also want to thank Templeton and uh, Nick and Chris especially for putting this on and making all these talks possible for all of us here and elsewhere. And also for anyone who's watching on YouTube, uh, thanks for tuning in. So when we talk about incubating a future metaphysics, um, uh, you can see me if I move around, right? Okay. Uh, using quantum gravity. Now this talk is partly methodological. It's partly philosophy of physics, partly philosophy of science. And so part of this talk is about how to use philosophy of physics to do metaphysics. And so as we go through um, this talk, part of these things are going to be quasi-philosophical and quasi-methodological in nature. So uh, we're using a PDF, and the PDF has messed up the slides a bit. So at different points, there's going to be errors in the slides. Uh, I'll tell you what those errors are. One error, bullet points on these. Uh, so we're going to go through, I'm going to give you two errors. These two errors are the sorts of things that the metaphysician ought to avoid in doing metaphysics. I'm going to give us, uh, I'll explain the, the structure of these points later. I'm going to give us uh, three options for what we might take the relationship between physics and metaphysics to be. I'm providing a sort of methodology for how we can use philosophy of physics to do metaphysics, but then that assumes presumably some relationship between physics and metaphysics. So I'm going to talk about three options for what that relationship might be. I'll go through four historical examples where we've seen the interplay of physics and metaphysics and how metaphysics or our metaphysical understanding of the world has been helped by our physical understanding of the world. And that'll give us five accounts of the abstract concrete distinction. Uh, this is the point where the paper is going to turn from a sort of historical analysis and one in which I'm arguing for a connection between physics and metaphysics. In the second half, I'm going to be telling what I take a particular connection to be. I'm going to say, in particular, quantum gravity, loop quantum gravity and string theory, can help us understand the nature of abstract concrete distinction. In particular, it's going to need a new formulation. There's, there's some problems with this distinction. Uh, and then I'll go through some comments. Now, technically, there's another, there's another, you know, there's this guy in between, but messed it up. Before it was two, three, four, or five, and so I just left that off. But in be before doing that, I'm actually going to give us a small overview of loop quantum gravity and string theory before jumping into the five accounts of the concrete abstract uh, distinction. So the two errors. The two errors that the metaphysician ought to avoid, they're familiar. And by the way, a lot of these should have been coming up in sections. I didn't mean for everything to be showing up at once. Uh, so if there's a lot of text on the screen, don't read the text. That's going to distract you. Uh, just listen to my voice and follow along with where I am talking. Uh, dogmatism, come what physics may, and this metaphysics will stand. The idea being that whatever happens in the physical world, no matter what we think about chemistry or biology, you're a dogmatic if you think that your particular metaphysics is always going to be protected from the goings-on of physics. This is, this is a holding-on error. We don't want to hold on too tightly to our metaphysics. The second one is speculativism. The idea is in building metaphysical systems, the idea being that we can just um, do this and have a, a, a lot of 
uh, confidence in building our systems, though we could, uh, while at the same time ignoring what's going on in our physical theories. I'm going to do some metaphysics. I'm just going to read some logic, some Kant, some Hegel, something, and I'm going to build metaphysical systems without paying attention at all, and that this should be a good idea. Now, usually both of these errors are tied to the fact that when we build metaphysical systems that are working well, they have a big scope. They're hopefully something like simple. They're internally coherent. And so they have these virtues to them. And so we get convinced often that because of these virtues, we didn't, we're not going to be uh, too worried about what's going on in the physical world. They have these virtues otherwise. Uh, now, we think that these virtues should give us some confidence, internal coherence and whatnot. But they're not going to be sufficient. Because as we're going to see, though things are internally coherent, simplistic, uh, and have a big scope, we run into problems. The second thing, not only do we run into problems with respect to the physical world, as we're going to see, but as Kant says, as Kant critiques, just because you've got this big system that works, it might just be make-believe. You, know, you might be just making up some story about the world. And so this is really why we want to tune in and tie up, uh, you know, rein in our speculativism. Uh, so Kant says, with respect to speculativism, am I getting cut off at the bottom? Furthermore, if one is beyond the circle of experience, then one is sure of not being refuted through experience. The charm in expanding one's progress. Yep, it looks like we... This one is done. Yeah. We are fixing this. So. Okay. The charm in expanding one's cognitions is so great that one, cannot, one can be stopped in one's progress only by bumping into a clear contradiction. When doing speculative metaphysics, if you're detached from the world, you should be floating like a balloon full of helium. You're not uh, attached strong enough to reality. And then you have no assurance that what you're doing maps onto reality in any way, except for the fact that we think reality is internally coherent. So the claim, this, these problems, let me go back, the problems of dogmatism, dogmatism and speculative metaphysics are old problems. The question is, how can we use uh, meta, uh, philosophy of physics and quantum gravity in steering the metaphysician through these two horns? Not being dogmatic with respect to the metaphysics we have, and then not being overly um, speculative in moving forward. Claim one, paying attention to our physical theories when doing metaphysics can help protect against both errors. In particular, quantum gravity is well appointed to this task. The second claim is, if quantum gravity, then there is no abstract concrete distinction. Right? So there's two claims, and the two halves of the paper are split. First half of the split paper is going to be arguing for this first claim. The second one is going to be arguing for the second. There's no sense in arguing for the second if I can't do the first. The first is, there is a relationship. And the second one is, and here is a particular instance of it. Now, uh, claim two is strongly stated. That's actually not what I'm going to be able to argue for. What I will argue for is, if string theory or loop quantum gravity are true, then standard accounts of the abstract concrete distinction do not hold. Still a good claim, not as strong as the first. Now, this is an objection we should all think about. Right? The first objection is, hey, but isn't metaphysics and physics different sorts of things? Doesn't the physical world and the metaphysical world, um, aren't they separated in some important way? Isn't metaphysics beyond physics? Now, I don't want to answer this question. I don't want to have to take a position on this. The worry is, yeah. So instead of saying, instead of assuming some relationship between metaphysics and physics, so this person here is right. If there's no relationship between metaphysics and physics, then how am I going to prove the first claim? The first claim is that physics is going to be useful in building our metaphysics. But if there's no relationship between these two worlds, then how can that be the case? Now, I'm going to, my, I'm going to say that that claim holds, even if this is correct. So I'm not going to take a stand on this. But let's go ahead and let's pursue three options for what might be the relationship. Okay? So look at, let's say that you have a really super thick metaphysics. We're going to call it pure metaphysics. A pure, okay, so super thick, you have a pure metaphysics. Super thin, you have no metaphysics. You're a positivist. You, get th you throw it all out. And then maybe you're somewhere in the middle. You're like a quinine, a holist where you have some metaphysics, it's just sitting at the internal part of your web. So we're going to consider three kinds of metaphysics and how these three kinds relate to our physical theories. So option one, there is no relationship between metaphysics and physics. Well, why? Because there is no metaphysics. These are the positivists. The second relationship between metaphysics and physics is the holist position. 
They are not worlds apart. They are simply aspects of one holistic web. Now, the third position is more difficult, and I think I need to move this up. Okay? They are, in fact, worlds apart. The truth value of any metaphysical thesis is independent of all physical truths. Now, I don't know. I can't prove one option over the other. I have a favorite up there, but I can't prove it. And I want my argument to depend on me being able to do something that I can't do. So my argument is going to move forward independent of which, which camp you find yourself in. Positivism, holism, and the last position we're going to call pure metaphysics. These three positions are mutually exclusive, though they're technically not exhaustive. However, they do range over a broad space. They span a big part of the logical space. Because it spans between no metaphysics, super thick metaphysics, and then some blended metaphysics where you're a holist. Uh, for instance, I don't know where exactly how to put Kant or Aristotle into these three camps. Now, my claim is that claims one and two hold no matter which of the three positions you hold. Okay? Now, what you should find surprising is, uh, well, this one's not surprising. Pos positivism, this is going to be trivial. Why? Well, there's no metaphysics, so of course you should pay attention to physics. So the, the actual claim is um, use physics when building any metaphysics there is. The positivist says there is no metaphysics, so it's satisfied trivially. The second one. Uh, the Quanians love this. This is exactly what the Quanians tell us to do. You shake your web with your physics, and of course what's going to happen? The internal parts are going to jiggle. The Quanians aren't going to have any problem with this in principle. The last one, which just got cut off, uh, the pure metaphysics or metaphysicians are going to need some convincing. What they're going to say is, look, we believe these are worlds apart. Your first and second claim seems to think there's a relationship between these worlds. We're just at odds. Right? How are you going to convince me of this if we just are at odds about the nature of the relationship between these structures? The way that this, my argument is actually going to go, so they're going to, oh, I'll do this, this is nice. Uh, they're going to say, mark that out with blue, we don't believe you. That rhymed, I didn't mean to. This is my argument. Even if option three is true, and there is some items of pure metaphysics, we don't know when we are doing pure metaphysics. We cannot be sure when some principle or thesis is, in fact, independent of some physical truths. So you're going around the world, you're theorizing, you're a pure metaphysician, you say, these are my physical theories, I think. Here's some metaphysical theories. But it's not like those theses about the world come labeled. Some of they, like they say, I am an item of pure metaphysics. The physical world will never adjust me, or I am independent of all physical truths. So my claim here is, even if it's the case that there are items of pure metaphysics, we don't know when we're doing it. And since we don't know when we're doing it, we ought to pay attention to our physical theories just in case they impinge upon what we take to be pure metaphysics. And so I'm able to get all three people into the camp. The positives will get to the camp trivially. They're actually not going to listen to this talk. Uh, the uh, Quanians are going to get, listen to this talk. They'll be like, yeah, we're on board with this. And now the pure metaphysicians are going to say, you're right. Maybe we don't always know when we're doing pure metaphysics, so maybe we should pay attention to physics, but how often is this actually the case? How often is it really the case that we have an item of metaphysics that turns out not to be pure, that turns out to be that the physical theories can touch that theory? So they're going to still be a little skeptical. Now, in order to address the skepticism, we're going to explore four cases. So we did, we did the first, two, two errors, three uh, options. And I'm going to do four cases from the history of science, where it seems that we have some metaphysical thesis, and that metaphysical thesis was thought to like stand beyond science and physics and the goings on in the world, and yet came to be attacked by the physics or the science of the world. And uh, that, what it should do is it should cause us to second guess any sort of metaphysics we have now. We've been wrong, like think about the pessimistic meta-induction. We've been wrong in the past with respect to this being an item of pure metaphysics. Maybe we should be agnostic about the items that we have now, and just keep an ear to the ground with respect to what the physics is saying or doing. Uh, the, uh, these four examples, very familiar to most people in this room. I imagine if you're in this room, you're not a pure metaphysician. Uh, given the t or maybe you are, and you're really angry with the title of the talk, and you're here to fight. Uh, given that you're in this room, and given that I know a lot of people's background, and those of you who are in Chicago, uh, these cases are familiar. I'm not going to go over all of them in detail in order to make sure that we're saving time. The first is, Aristotle had lots of metaphysics, but this is the one that I talked about from the talk. 
Aristotle, it is a metaphysical fact that there is a prime mover who is responsible for causing the eternal circular motion of the heavenly bodies. Kant, this is everyone's favorite example, especially those who do GR. Space is essentially three-dimensional and Euclidean. The second, the PII, which is the principle of identity of indiscernibles. Leibniz claim that this is something like a metaphysical or logical truth. The uh, fourth, future contingents, presentism and non-standard logic. We're not gonna have time for this one. This one's more difficult to explain anyway, so I'm glad. Uh, we're gonna probably just do the first three, and I'm only gonna rush through the first one. So we're gonna talk only in detail about this, the middle two. So again, these four cases are to convince the pure metaphysician that we've been mistaken in the past, and so we might be mistaken today. This is one of those errors. I don't know. This, you have to promise people, believe me, they looked pretty on my computer. So the first caveat, uh, each of these cases have textual nuances. You read Kant, it's not like Kant comes out and says this is exactly what I meant. So there's textual nuances in the, in the, the philosophical texts. There are interpretive uncertainty regarding the physics. It's not like physics says this is how you ought to interpret me. Uh, I'm going to try or strive to take the received, the plain, the straightforward readings of both the text and the physics. Of course, this can be debated. I'm not trying to. I'm not saying there's a conflict because I'm handling. I'm used, interpreting the theory in some like strange way. I'm interpreting it in a sort of plain Jane way, and there seems to be a conflict. Poor Jane. Uh, you can always get out of the sort of four conflicts that I'm giving by doing a modicum of uh, philosophical or hermeneutical gymnastics. You could always pick up some sort of tricky reading and get, get out of these things. One of those things you can do, oh my goodness, this is so gross looking. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what it's supposed to say down there. Uh, one thing that you could do is you could just deny realism. So I'm saying that there's some conflict in the way that the physical world is uh, being described by our theories and the way that, uh, with the metaphysics we have. You could always just be an instrumentalist and get out of a lot of these conflicts. I'm going to be uh, starting from the assumption that the plain reading is a sort of uh, faithful reading of the theory. The sort of plain reading of the philosophical text is a, is a faithful interpretation of the position, philosophical position held by the, position, uh, held by the author. And I'm going to assume something, some form of realism about our theories in order to show that there's a conflict between um, theory and our philosophical metaphysics. We can come back to the slide if you wonder how much this actually weakens the project. Aristotle. Let's not talk about Aristotle. I'll go back to the slide just so you aren't tempted to read it. Aristotle had lots of metaphysics that he built into his sort of cosmology. The, there's this assumption that the eternal sphere where the, the planets are was made of the quintessence. The quintessence was perfect and eternal and changeless. Uh, the stuff on the earth was change and damnable things. It could go through corruption. There's a lot of metaphysics about, you know, they have to follow circular orbits because that's the only sort of orbit appropriate towards eternal motion or uh, sort of a changeless motion, so to speak, because there's no change with respect to each motion on the part of the circle. It's complicated. There's a lot of metaphysics that Aristotle builds into his system. And that metaphysics hamstrung uh, astronomers' ability to make uh, predictions or, or to design physical models of the world for 1,500 years. Now, there are some exceptions. People did deviate, but the, but the standard person in the, in the standard uh, astronomer worked on the Aristotelian Ptolemaic system deviating more and more and more as we can't accommodate all the data or as, as we seem to see that we're getting more and more complicated systems and we're not able to get all the information. So what this means though is that Aristotle had this background metaphysics. The orbits had to be circular for this philosophical reason. They had to be eternal for this philosophical reason. And this kept us for 1500 years from being able to have a sort of empirically adequate theory. Now when we end up moving past Oh, boy. Uh, good. <laughs> I don't know exactly what's going on in the slides. Uh, when we end up moving past Aristotle, we don't do it primarily through another, phil another metaphysical account. It's not like we say Aristotle is wrong because it's metaphysics. Now, that does happen to a little bit. The medievals end up critiquing Aristotle. But the big reason why we move past Aristotle is because it sucks. It doesn't work, right? It's because of our inability for 1,500 years to come up with an empirically adequate theory that we jettison Aristotle and we just develop new systems. Later on, some metaphysics comes in to fill in gaps. 
But uh, the primary mover is our uh, 1,500 years failure to accommodate the empirical evidence. So here we have something that looked like some metaphysics. Uh, a thesis about the world, which is believed to be an item of metaphysics, was shown to be false, or at least to come to conflict with physical facts. Okay. This is, a, this is a, a case I think that we're familiar with. The second case, and I'm sorry these slides are jinky, uh, Kant. Let's talk about Kant. Kant is familiar, but I'm going to actually give us the quotes because I found them elucidating, and I often don't see the quotes to back up these claims. So I had to go and look to see where they were. He says, we're concerned solely with this. Remember, he thought that space was essentially Euclidean and three-dimensional. We're concerned solely with this. Space and time in its pure form, sensation in general, its matter. We can cognize only the form, uh, the former a priori, i.e. prior to all actual perception. Prior to any experiences you have about the physical world, we can um, uh, we have this knowledge of space and time a priori. These are going to be called items of the pure intuition. This is the important part. We can cognize only the former a priori, i.e. prior to actual experience. You guys can't read this slide. Kant says essentially space, uh, what is going on here? The concept of space, therefore, is a pure intuition, the fundamental form of all external sensation. This pure intuition, this is an important part, is in fact easily perceived in geometric axioms. Which geometric axioms? Euclid's. Since therefore nothing at all can be given, what this is. Okay, I'm going to read it off of here. The, the slide got cut off, I apologize. I'm only going to do this for the ones where there are actual quotes that I'm reading. I don't mind missing things otherwise. You want to skip Kant? Oh, why do you guys want to skip Kant? Well, well, yeah, it looks like it's messed up on this one too. At any rate, so what ends up going to happening is uh, Kant grounds his notions of why there needs to be three dimensions in Euclidean, or he says basically that all of our perceptions of space and time has to be essentially Euclidean three dimensional. Now, from these things, and he doesn't just mean geometry simpliciter in nowadays terms; he means Euclidean geometry in particular. This is all the geometry that there was. Uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, look here. I don't know what's going on. Okay, because of this, Kant says two things. First, he says, because space is Euclidean, between any two points of space, there is but one straight line. In space, there are, and in space, there are no more than three dimensions. Now, we know that in general relativity, now note that this is supposed to be a priori. It's supposed to know all this stuff a priori. In general relativity, we know that between any two points in space and time, it's possible that you have more than one quote unquote straight line passing through. And uh, if string theory is true, uh, space is not three-dimensional, it's 10-dimensional, or 26-dimensional, or 109.75-dimensional. Now, you might think those first ones make sense, the last one's silly. Why do you think the last one's silly? Because what the hell does a 0.75 dimension stand for, right? But this is the point. We often come to the table with this idea that certain things just don't make sense. But this is the same position that everyone's been in when looking at novel ideas. Everyone says, that's impossible. You know what the uh, Aristotelians thought? It was impossible that the Earth could move, right? Because everything would just be thrown off the Earth. But the Earth isn't thrown off. How can, this, how can we have a dimension that's 0.75? We don't know how to make sense of what that means. All I'm, maybe this doesn't make sense. But the point is, we're always confronted with things that don't make sense. Look to the theories to see what the theory tells us makes sense about what the physical world is like. Anyways, that's just a little joke number. It doesn't matter. OK, so again, don't look there. Again, we had, a physical, we had some metaphysics about the world, Kant's, which was then uh, refuted or put into pressure by our physical theories. First general relativity, and then possibly string theory. Now, a lot of these examples are familiar. I'm only going to go through one more. The last one is the principle of the identity of indiscernibles. According to Leibniz, it is not true that two substances may be exactly alike and differ only numerically. Now, some philosophers, and notably Nick and myself, uh, debate uh, the proper form of this conflict or maybe even the merit of this argument. But on the face of things, quantum mechanics seems to contradict this principle. Why is that? You guys are familiar. That colon, I bet you can guess where it was supposed to go. 
uh, entanglement, you have entangled states, and the way that we interpret these entangled states is that this is a true particle state. It's a two particle state, that's why there's two arrows. This is a standard plain Jane interpretation of the singlet state. And whatever can be predicted of the one particle can be predicted of the other. They have the same position. They have the same momentum, they have the same charge. And with the singlet state, they also have the same quote unquote spin, whatever spin they end up having. It seems that quantum mechanics allows for the existence of numerically distinct objects, which are indiscernible. They have all the same properties, and yet they're, the, and yet they're distinct objects, according to the plain Jane reading of quantum mechanics and the, and the PII. So again, we seem to have some, stent, some uh, metaphysical or logical principle, which is coming into conflict with our metaphysics. Uh, with our physics, apologize. Uh, this one, future contingents, presentism. Let's, I just want to go a little bit slower so people can think of it. We've gone through two. We've uh, referred, I guess we've gone through three. We talked a little bit about, about Aristotle. And in each case, there's some piece that seems like it's metaphysics and not physics. And we thought that no matter what the physical, come what may in the physics, this is going to be true. No matter how the planets moved around in Aristotle's system, it's going to be the case that, the, that, the, that they move eternally and in circular orbits. The next one is weird. I'm not going to go through it, but I'll just refer to it. Before we knew general relativity and special relativity, the common assumption about the world is that which exa exists is that which exists now. The problem is, how then do you understand future contingents? Will there be a sea battle tomorrow? However you answer that, the question then is, what is the truth maker for that sentence? Presumably the sea battle tomorrow. Anyways, what ends up happening is that uh, logicians see this conflict that what exists now, what exists is what exists now. We don't know how truth makers about the future without saying that there exist things in the future today. And so they come up with three value logic to get around this problem. And this is one metaphysics, um, i.e. this assumption about the sort of what exists now is all that exists. This assumption influences this other assumption about what the truth value for sentences are. Okay, this metaphysics is influencing each other. General relativity and special relativity come in and say, you don't need this first assumption. It's not necessarily true. We're not going to talk about it, so we're going to get past it. The final caveat, and this is, it seems like on the slides where I have a lot, it's completely messed up. This is crazy. Okay. Like, these caveats might not concern those in the room, and so I'm not going to be too worried about reading each piece of this caveat but I, I will read it anyway. This is, even my slides got all messed up. I don't know what's going on here. It's like, it's like when I exported it, it destroyed my slides. Okay, so some aspects of the, so, okay, so some aspects of the world were thought to be a product of pure reason, uh, merely outside the keen of empirical investigation, metaphysical, and we were wrong. These examples demonstrate that we cannot expect to predict don't read this. I hate when people put all this text on slides. It's all wasn't supposed to be on a slide. It's supposed to like come up in parts. These examples demonstrate that we cannot expect how to predict or how drastically our future physical theories might reshape our current perceptions of reality. Like you, if you were an Aristotelian or Ptolemaic uh, you know, uh, astronomer, you're not going to be able to predict the invention of the concept of inertia which was required by Newton and Galileo. So you can't predict the invention of concepts. So you can't, you can't predict how the sort of future conceptual landscape is going to change is to see what's possible and what's impossible. Uh, when Leibniz was coming up with his principles, he didn't know about that someone might come up with this idea of quantum mechanics and there might be this thing called entanglement. We can't predict today how our future physical theories are going to affect what we think to be impossible. So, or right now, if you're a pure metaphysician, you're going to say, it's impossible that the physical world will ever affect or change this piece of metaphysics. But the history of our intellectual history says, we've been wrong about that. And so let's just be agnostic about those things. If you believe that there is items of pure metaphysics, cool. Just be agnostic about which particular things happen to be there. Maybe this is pure metaphysics, maybe it's not. Maybe our physical theory will cause us to be adjusted. Um, now, this is, again, terrible text. I'm just going to read it. If you're a Quinean and, uh, about metaphysics, then the guidance of physics is straightforward. One ought to modify the more central aspects of their web in order to be consistent with their favorite interpretation of the new physics. Straightforward. If you are aiming to construct a, a pure metaphysics, then in each of the above cases, our new phil uh, phil uh, physical theory, what it does is it, in it instructs you how to purify your, your metaphysics. 
It says, hey, I thought I had an item of pure metaphysics. It's coming into complex with the physical theory. I need to shave some more stuff off. I was wrong. You can minimize and figure out what actually are the items of pure metaphysics. Okay? So in the case of the first one where uh, you had thought maybe that the world would can, that there's a metaphysical fact that the orbits of the celestial bodies were essentially circular and eternal with general relativity. You say, well, I was wrong about the essential shape or age of the universe. The, age, the universe began to exist. So you can shave those parts off of your pre metaphysics and say, that part was actually physics. Ooh, OK. Now, let's say that I've done my first job well. My first job is that we ought to be looking to our physical theories and doing metaphysics. And this is no matter your position on the relationship between these two things. The second one is where we're actually going to move into the nature of how quantum gravity is a particularly useful incubator for our future metaphysics. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, loop quantum gravity and string theory and then show how they put pressure on one aspect of our metaphysics. That one aspect being the abstract concrete distinction. Now, uh, this isn't the first time anyone's brought up this conflict. Uh, Vincent and Esfeld bring this up in a paper. They mention this conflict. Um, I talked about this in a previous paper. But this is the first time that I've seen the following done. I'm going to go through every account of the abstract con concrete distinction that I'm able to find and show how each one of them is a problem. It's not just a problem for some formulations of the distinction. It's a problem for all the formulations that have been proposed. So let's go through it a little bit. Again, this was nicer at another age of its history. Uh, in general relativity, we model space-time by the ordered pair M and G. We all presume, or many of us in this room, maybe not everyone, and, and I don't know who's in Chicago and who's listening, G represents the metric field and encodes the spatial relationships between objects, right? So G tells me how far away I am from this table. It tells me how my, uh, my shape is going to change over space and time, right? If I'm like any academic, I'm going to get shorter and wider as I get older in time, and general relativity should predict that. Now, in loop quantum gravity, what do we do? We take the G and we quantize it. Through quantization, G gets replaced by psi G. Psi G are quantum states, and th their interpretation is complicated. We can think about them as like quantum geometric uh, or encoding quantum geometrical information. Uh, and again, we could talk, I'm not going to go through a lot of details about loop quantum gravity because this is aimed at metaphysicians. <coughs> the important point <coughs> is that there are no technically geometric relations in loop quantum gravity. G gets thrown out and gets replaced by psi G. Psi G no longer encodes sort of linear uh, lengths and areas and volumes that G used to encode. There are some relations defined by psi g, but these do not yield a structure which can be standardly identified as a, a spatio-temporal structure. Wow, these are, you know, this, this slide is so nice looking when I first read that, right? So now without g, there are no lengths, areas, or volumes. We got that. So think about the world. Strip the world from uh, lengths, areas, and volumes, shapes as well, uh, kind of uh, angles, I think. And then what I want you to do is also start stripping anything from the world which is dependent upon lengths, areas, or volumes for its definition uh, or, for, um, or, or if it's dependent upon those things. So velocity, for instance, which is kind of hard to see, it requires that things are actually changing spatially over time. There is no change. There aren't lengths or times, so there's no velocity. There's no momentum for an obvious reason. Uh, your Coulomb force is dependent upon an R squared. Technically, there aren't any R squareds. There's no radial lengths between objects. Forces, uh, like the electromagnetic force, uh, requires you to integrate over volume. There aren't any sort of Cartesian volumes in this structure. So you, as standardly formulated and understood, you don't have any of this structure. Perhaps we're going to have a new formulation. But in our terms of what we standardly understand as forces and volumes and energies, when none of these things are present in the theory. Spin networks, we're going to call spin networks as the fundamental pieces of our ontology in loop quantum gravity. They are represented by our quantum state, psi g. When a spin network takes the form as described by special weave states, magic happens. I really wish I had this all still blocked off so I could go back so you can't read it. Uh, not all states are weave states. The ma vast majority of them, I mean, technically, you're comparing infinities and infinities, but the vast majority of them are not weak states. 
But when they come to take the form of a wave state, magic happens. What is that magic? Now we can read the bottom. The quantum properties associated with the networks, the spin networks, mimic properties of classical geometry. So you get things that look like lengths. You get things that look like volumes and areas, but only in these special states. Uh, the quantum, uh, good. So and people like uh, uh, Nick and Chris and Daniele Ariti argue that because of this, or because of this feature, that space-time emerges from these spin networks when they take these forms. So originally, we don't really have something that looks spatio-temporal. You don't have space-time lengths. You don't have space-time areas or volumes. A lot of this you guys know. But not only you don't even have, Stan as Stanley understood, uh, forces, momentum, and energy described by the, this mathematical physics. But when you do, when the states of the system come to look like weave states, a structure of form, um, appears which looks familiar and which we could model onto standard spatio-temporal structure. Uh, so the emergence of space-time continuum and the geometry will be the result of the quantum properties of the atoms of space-time. This is Daniele Ariti. One influential idea is you guys could read this. Space-time structure emerges from appropriately benign semi-classical spin networks. This is uh, Nick and Chris. So the idea is that space-time emerges from this. And uh, this is your position too, right? Cool. String theory. We're not going to have time. At least when I was timing myself, we're not going to have much time for string theory. We can uh, talk about this during question and answer, but a lot of the same, not exactly the same things can happen, but a lot of the same stuff happens. The mathematical physics, which is described by the theory, doesn't map onto our phenomenological notion of space and time. So fundamentally, there isn't this structure in the theory. We're going to shoot past this. Now, this was a really fun slide. So let me tell you what was supposed to happen. So what's supposed to happen is, you're all going to sit here, and as I'm talking, you're going to look at this little red robin that's sitting in the back of the screen. Forget about the red overlay. And then what we're going to say is, look, now we've got this notion of loop quantum gravity. Two, a couple things should be surprising. Space and time are gone. There isn't this sort of structure. And you might be thinking to yourself, space and time are missing, and yet we have these things called spin networks. Where are spin networks? Like, where do they exist in? How do we think about the ontology of spin networks when there isn't the standard notion of a space of lengths and areas and volumes and places and locations? And you're going to start worrying about the abstract concrete distinction. Usually we distinguish abstract and concrete objects using structure like space time. And so the goal of this section is we want to save the red robin who is supposed to be sitting on the screen looking at you with nothing overlaying it. We want to save the, huh? It's a cardinal, yeah, it's a J, not a robin. <laughs> Why do you guys know so much about birds? You're ruining, <laughs> ruining my talk. Uh, okay, we're gonna we're gonna pretend that uh, the physical world has changed now that this is a red robin. I think the screen is just distracting you. So this uh, <laughs> this overlay, this red robin here. I'm gonna keep saying this. We want to save the red robin from um, elimination, annihilation. We want to let the red robin remain a concrete particular object. And we want to distinguish the red, red robin from redness itself. We want to distinguish red robins from redness. And at this point, the red is supposed to fade in, right? And that's supposed to be a fun slide. Oh, well. OK, these are the different ways that we're going to try this. OK, we're going to try to save the red robin using space time, right? Maybe red robins are those things in space time. It's not going to work, right? OK, maybe uh, we're going to use some uh, this idea by DC Williams about abstraction and clustering. Maybe D.C. Williams' approach will save the red robin. Mental, uh, mentality and sensibility, this is Frege's notion. Causation seems promising. Maybe we could save the red robin through causation. Red robins do things, redness doesn't. And then Descartes. Technically, Descartes not about the abstract concrete distinction, right? It's not really about that, but it's about the mind-body distinction. It's related, so I threw it in there. Let's go and talk. Space time. So the first, the first try is an object is abstract. You guys are familiar with this. Just in case it is not in space-time, and otherwise it is concrete. However, what do we know about space-time and string theory and loop quantum gravity? Fundamentally, there is no space-time. And so fundamentally, no objects are in space-time. Therefore, no objects are concrete. All objects are, by default, abstract. And this seems strange. Right? If you fail to be in, in space-time, then you are not concrete. Since there is no space-time, nothing's in it. And so all objects, by default, 
are forced to be, fail to be concrete. This is bad for the red robin, right? Or J, or whatever you want to call that silly bird. Right? The strings of string theory and the loops of loop quantum gravity, they do represent physical things, but they don't represent concrete things. And this is strange. How can the, the physical theory represent physical things and yet rep not represent concrete things? This was also an interesting side. It just says what across it, but it was much more interesting when it was in an animation. Let's move on. You might think that at the end of the day, we're going to save things. because I, I included this notion of fundamentally in here. I said in the previous slides when we were talking about loop quantum gravity that in loop quantum gravity, space time emerges. Maybe we can save the notion of con the concrete objects by saying concrete ob objects are those objects in emergent space time. Maybe the idea is that I've included all this stuff about fundamentally here. At the end, we can talk about this if you want. We won't have time, I think, during the talk. Uh, ooh. This is unfortunate. Okay, I'm gonna physically move this. Can I move this cat? No, I can't. <laughs> uh, I, okay, I'm going to. <laughs> that cat is hiding a slide. I'm going to tell you what DC Williams says. DC Williams says for DC Williams, abstract objects aren't something that lives in a platonic heaven. You know, they're they're not abstract like that. Con abstract objects are just like concrete objects. They're in space and time. What distinguishes concrete and abstract objects is you build concrete objects by co-locating a bunch of abstract objects, or what he calls tropes. You get some color, you get some shapes, and you push it all together in a particular way, and it makes a particular kind of concrete object. Uh, now, so what's, and what you can do is, when you find something that you could abstract off, that's an abstraction, that's a trope. You've taken it off or away from the concrete clustering. You've tripped off a piece of the clustering. So what distinguishes concrete objects and abstract objects is how things are clustered together in space and time. They're co-located. They're co-present in some particular mixed way. He says at the bottom, the concrete cat is a co-location or peculiar interpenetration, the unique congress and the sense of volume of very particular tropes, including particular colors and shapes. And so this is what the cat is. You gather all the tropes together in one place in space and time, and that's what a concrete cat is. But we know what this is going to be problems for us if the cat's disappeared. The problem, of course, is that if space fails to exist fundamentally, then so does this distinction between abstract and concrete particulars. No tropes are spatio-temporally clustered, according to quantum gravity, since there is no space or time fundamentally in order to do that clustering, or with respect to which that clustering can occur. Now note that, for similar reasons, Plato's distinction between universals and concrete particulars also fails to hold. It has to do with how these things are instantiated in space and time. All right, let's move on again. Look at two down, four or five to go. Let's talk about, we, we, we did the one about grouping things together, tropes. We did space and time. Let's talk about this one. This is Frege's. He says that an object is abstract if and only if it is both non-mental and non-sensible. Uh, Spin networks, are they mental? Are they mental objects, like your thoughts? Well, no. They, we think that they would continue to exist uh, even if there were no minds to perceive or think about them. Spin networks and strings are manifest only at energy scales, which far outstrip our biological sensory equipment. So in, strictly speaking, with respect to human sensation, quantum gravity posits the existence of objects which are non-sensible. So they're both non-mental, non-sensible, Therefore, they are abstract. How can the loops of loop quantum gravity and the strings of string theory be abstract objects? There's something wrong here. Now, one place where we might locate the difficulty is you might say, well, you're reading this term nonsensible too strongly. Maybe we don't, maybe Frege didn't mean nonsensible or sensible in terms of what we can directly sense with our eyes and mouths and ears and things. Maybe we could use tools and things. Now, we won't go through this, but we could talk through the different modality of sensibility. What could Frege have meant by sensible or non-sensible? Did he mean it in terms of just human sensation? Did he mean to include also those things which are indirectly relatable to human sensation with like a telescope or some tools? Did he mean to include those things, um, it's non or sensibility is supposed to be uh, expressed into, in terms of anything relatable to any product of evolution, any animal, bats and mice and 
future uh, instances of human beings? Is this what the term, the, sense, the, the modality is uh, sensible or non-sensible? So if, there is, if something is non-sensible for all products of evolution, then it's non-sensible? Uh, perhaps relatable to any logically possible kind of organism. We won't go through all instances of the modality in the paper. I talk about these. Uh, they're not going to work. Ooh, 10 minutes. Whew. Okay. We're going to talk even faster. Glad I could skip this slide. They're not going to work. There's so many problems with Frege's account. Now, you might think causation is the key. You might say, uh, this is maybe what made us feel odd when I said that the loops and the strings were physical but not concrete. You say if they're not concrete, how can they be physical things? Concrete's hard, right? You, we call it concrete because we run into it and we, it, it impresses itself upon us. Abstract objects doesn't affect us in any way. Maybe the key is causation. And maybe this is what Frege had in mind with sensibility. You know, it causes us to have sensations of some sort. Uh, sad days, this isn't going to work. Okay. Now, I don't want you to read too far ahead because these are supposed to be like punchy. Okay, so we call that loop quantum gravity, for instance. There are no velocities, forces, momentum, or energy fundamentally. At least any instances of these which would require uh, geometry for their definition. Uh, let's think about this baseball example. All right? So base, let's assume that yesterday there's a large rectangular window near a bookcase and that today the window lies in a pile of irregularly shaped small glass shards much further from the bookcase and there's a baseball lying there. Now what would we infer? There's been a change in the state of the world. We would say that something caused the window to break, and that cause is the baseball itself. We locate causation when we, look, when we notice changes in the world. But in loop quantum gravity, when, when there are not things like lengths and distances and shapes, much of this description falls out. There are no large rectangular. There is no uh, pile of irregularly shaped small Shards. I mean, you got the shards, but you know, much of this description just goes, it just gets erased. It's just not the case that the physical world has these facts in them anymore. And so what ends up happening is if change gets erased from the world, the world undergoes much less change in this case because there's much less facts with respect to what the world can change with, res with respect to. Okay? If change is missing from the world, then a lot of the sources of places where causes are entering into the world change or go missing. Causes do stuff. They make changes in the world, at least our, our common notion of causes. The sort of causation that we want for the red robin not to get reduced to redness, the red robin needs to eat worms and fly from tree to tree. Eating worms and flying from tree to tree isn't possible if there are not spatial lengths and distances for the red robin to go to. Open its mouth and close and eat and digest. But things are even worse than for Luke Quan gravity in particular for the following reason. Again, you guys are going to read ahead and it's going to be sad. So don't read ahead. Okay, so it's even worse. In loop quantum gravity, the theory suffers from the problem of time. I'm just going to talk about this, and I'm not actually going to go through all the slides, so just stay with me. There is a variable t in the theory. The question is, how do we invert, uh, interpret the, the variable t? You could say t represents time. If t represents time, oh, sorry. If you say t doesn't represent time, then there is no time in our theory. T is the only object uh, which can play or which is putatively supposed to be time. Time shows up, it's one of our coordinates, it should be this T variable. So if you say that's not time, well then time's just missing from the theory because you're not gonna interpret it that way. Uh, if there is no time in the theory, then in that description with the window, it, was said, it said yesterday the window was like this, today the window is like this, there's a change over time. Technically, you don't have these descriptions of one time and another time. It gets a little bit more complicated when we do the next part. If you think this t variable should represent time, the, the theory says that the dynamics of psi g is frozen with respect to that t. If you say that t is time, well, then psi g is claimed to be frozen with respect to it. This is the problem of time. But psi g, which, which encodes your quantum geometry, it gets coupled to your matter and energy fields. And so if psi g is frozen, your matter and energy fields are going to be frozen. And so if there's no change in psi g over time, then there can't be any change in how, mat in, uh, in your, in how matter and energy are represented in the world. So if, if, if matter and energy aren't changing over time, then there actually just is no change in the world, period. 
matter and energy just aren't doing anything. So if there's no change in the world, then in what sense are there causes in the world? In what sense can we save the red robin from redness by saying the red robin causes stuff to happen? The red robin can't do that. There aren't causes for it to do, or use, or utilize, or have, powers to have. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, <laughs> there's an object lurking about, I don't know why this slide worked better. If you found the, the objection, you get a prize. I'll give you all prizes. Um, abstruse metaphysical causes, sans time, aren't going to help distinguish red robins from redness. There might still be causes in the world. Perhaps, perhaps God upholds or causes the existence of reality every moment, moment by moment. This sort of, nat this sort of abstract or abstruse notion of cause uh, doesn't re uh, works even if the, the universe is frozen. God would just uphold or cause the existence of the world, uh, a frozen world over time. Uh, this isn't going to help the Red Robin, though. These sort of strange background metaphysical causes that don't require time, it's not going to help the Red Robin, which requires causation and time. The Red Robin needs to go out and do stuff. Okay, Descartes. The primary attribute of body is extension. Now, we don't need to actually say much about this. We know what happens to extension, right? If you don't have the geometry given to us by G, you just have some weird quantum stuff, when technically there is no extension primarily. So you have no body. You have no primary attributes for body. I just threw this in there. We don't need to actually talk about it. Um, let's go through some final comments. Okay? All current accounts of the abstract concrete distinction, at least as those that happen to be found by Josh, fail to properly demarcate the distinction between apple pie and the number pie. Under standard interpretations of everything that I've done. The argument is not that string theory and loop quantum gravity require each of these distinctions to fail. You can do some stuff, like you can just be an instrumentalist and get out of the problem. The argument is that given standard interpretations of these theories, there is a conflict with some aspect of our metaphysics. Now, I, my claim isn't that string theory and loop quantum gravity are the only things that cause problems. They do two things. They, they do cause problems, and they cause problems at a global level. Look at uh, electrons cause problems for Frege's notion of the abstract concrete distinction. Why? Because electrons are non-sensible, at least in the way that I, in the limited notion of modality I gave sensibility. They're non-sensible and they're non-mental. So they should be abstract. So these electrons cause problems for uh, Frege's notion. But string theory and loop quantum gravity cause problems for all formulations of the distinction as currently proposed. So they provide a very useful heuristic for doing metaphysics. They don't just attack one formulation. They've attacked a whole, uh, the whole family of uh, formulations of this one distinction. Uh, so they are global. They're, they're useful in this sense. Now, you might say, I'm glad this is kind of part off. You might say, look, string theory and loop quantum gravity, who cares about these things? Why? They're not, we don't have a good or direct empirical evidence in any, any interesting way for them. A lot of them have uh, mathematical or conceptual issues that still need to be filled in. So why should we adhere or listen to or pay attention to these theories which might very well be false in doing metaphysics? Even if string theory and loop quantum gravity are false, we should use them as tools for forcing us to reconsider what might be dogmatic about our metaphysics. Okay, two points on this. If you come to discover, let's say that you're a pure metaphysician, and you come to discover that some um, uh, possibly physical theory about the world affects what you are holding to be a metaphysical thesis, then you should think, wow, my metaphysical thesis is closer to the act what might actually be a physical theory than I suspected. The second thing is we've learned lots of things about false theories. We learned lots of things about Copernicus and Borelli and Kepler that were useful to us, though we think that they were false. You can still learn things from false theories. So even if they turn out to be false, we shouldn't just say we shouldn't pay attention to them. Look to see how they push on us. Does this physical theory, if true, push on my metaphysics? How might I, how might I be, be being dogmatic? What these physical theories do is they don't, they don't tell you what you already know. They don't say you're being dogmatic about what you already know. What they do is they reveal often dogmatism in you. They say, they say when you hear physical theory and, and you say, that's impossible. There's no way the world could be this way. It's revealing a dogmatic attitude with respect to some background assumptions. Now, some of those things might actually be impossible, but it's good to then evaluate it. They're tools for opening up the world to us, so to speak. Uh, 
Good. And if string theory and loop quantum is true, they can be used in doing less speculative metaphysics. You can follow them. You don't just have to think willy-nilly. You can say, I'm going to follow what these theories might be suggesting about the world. So look at no matter the positivism, Quinean, or a pure metaphysician, we ought to use physical theories as heuristics for avoiding both dogmatism and speculativism. Even if there are items of pure metaphysics, we, can, uh, we cannot know for certain when we have such items. As we have seen with the abstract concrete distinction, uh, quantum theories of gravity are powerfully effective in placing pressure on our metaphysics. And this is Finis. Uh, 
Is that, is that the first challenge? challenge? Um, yeah, that's the thought. Yeah, so uh, one thing, let's not do wave function realism right now. Uh, I want to do plain Jane interpretations, and then, uh, perhaps I'm wrong about this, but the plain Jane interpretation is not wave function realism where something lives in high dimensional space. But I'll get to that point as well. We could talk about non plain Jane readings. Uh, the plain Jane reading, though, it still seems to cause problems because you can have things. Uh, so, when a particle is in an eigenstate of momentum, it's not technically. Where it is in space and time seems to be undefined. There's a clear sense in which it's not really in space and time because it doesn't have a location. Now, uh, people have posited how to save this is by in terms of saying, well, we're going to save it not in terms of being in space and time, but being, but, uh, being able in space and time. So they, they are beables. So they, they are able to be in space and time. So one might think there's an easy way out with respect to quantum particles because while they might not have a well-defined location now, we know how to very easily give them a well-defined location. So they can stay concrete in that sense. And in a sense, they're wholly related to space and time in the right way. I, I still think that this is a problem for the distinction because you have to upgrade the distinction, right? Uh, the, uh, the problem, problem with strings and uh, loops, loops in particular is, it's, it's, it's I've, I've argued, argued for this in the paper, paper. There's, there's no, no sense, sense in which they are beables, spatial and temporal beables as well. At best, they define, in, in, in their, their best case scenarios, they, they, they can define spatial temporal relations, but they themselves aren't spatial temporally located there. They have properties which give rise to volumes and areas, but there is no uh, network in space and time at least that's standardly understood. Moreover, most of the networks aren't in space and time. They aren't weak states. So they don't, there's no sense in which they are beable without actually changing into something they aren't, so to speak. Uh, so that's the, the first point is I still think that there's a, a powerful distinction between uh, particles which are beables, so you can put them into space and time easily, and most of the states of Lupin gravity and waves of string theory, such that these things aren't spatial temporal. Uh, many, many, many loops, uh, states uh, just aren't related to spatial temporal structures in the right way. Right. The second thing, and, and you, you can tell me, Tom, if I've answered this sufficiently, and I might not have. But I do want to say, I don't think that it's a unique challenge. I still think that it's a, uh, a useful incubator for future uh, metaphysics because of how well it destroys these distinctions. It's hard to get out from that. The second one was you thought, well, maybe we could upgrade. Uh, you know, the space-time distinction in terms of Wallace's proposal. proposal. You say a concrete cat is just that thing which is a particular pattern in the universal wave function. function. There are, this is what actually the needs to probably happen. Metaphysicians, Metaphysicians need to come along alongside philosophy of physics and upgrade what we mean by the distinction. I think there is some ways that we can do this in terms of causation. If I was going to do it, Tom, I would use the causal uh, distinction between I, I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to say, say something, something and tell you I actually don't quite believe it, but I think a promising route would be to do it in terms of causation, upgrading this in terms of um, uh, re give it a new understanding of what, what causation looks like in um, these emergent theories of gravity. And I, I think that's part of what this group here is trying to do. If we want to account for, uh, if we want our physical theory, if we want this loop on gravity string theory to be uh, sort of empirically coherent or uh, not just be nonsense. We have to somehow relate it to the physical world in the right way. And I think that there has to be some other, some 
primary notions of causation that are going to have to be used that don't rely on space and time, length, distances, etc. Uh, but let's go. So, but please, uh, please, if you have a question, we'll be okay. to it. Okay, um, so my question is uh, as follows. Um, so you said that there is no component of space time, so there is no space time, right? Yep. yep. Um, well, I, mean, I refuse to say that exactly, but I, I didn't intend you to think that. Okay. Because I was thinking, well, maybe there is a way to, um, to, to keep uh, concreteness by keeping uh, spatial temporality. Say, I'm just asking, yeah, I have no idea. Yeah. Let, let's imagine that spatial temporality is a budget substance. Yeah. So there is no, spa no fundamental space time because there is only a derivative space time. Yeah. Like that. So, um, could we think that, um, what do you think of the idea that the concrete emerges somehow from the abstract form? Because it's a bit weird or strange, but since you said that we could have some very revolutionary claims, we could discover some very strange yeah, yeah. things. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah so, so the, the first thing I'll say is, we didn't say this, but one idea that I thought of, and I think I've, I've talked about this in, in some short conversations with Nick and Chris, is, uh, at least with Nick for sure, um, is whether or not we can save the complete notion. So you had this idea of uh, emerging concrete from the abstract. Let's just say, what if we get to say concrete objects, because concrete objects are just those things in emergent space time. So when we, now in order to answer, I don't think this is going to work. Uh, oh man, you can't see it. I had this fun slide where I jumped to the next one and, they, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, so that's just alone, and it says this box that he's talking about this question. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought that this might come up. So the, I don't think this is going to work for a couple of reasons. The first thing is, at least in loop on gravity, what emergence means is that the states come and take the form of a weak state, and then the quantum geometric properties associated with this look at the right energy scales, like those given to us uh, in a uh, Ramanian ge geometric setting. <coughs> setting. So the idea is, look, we've got this form, this expression. The first term looks like a Ramanian area, a Ramanian volume. And then there are these other terms. But if we don't look at high energies, we're not going to see those terms. We're not going to see the deviation away from the classical structure. So there's a sense in which at that classical level where you and I all live, there, when the states for the system come to take a weak state, which they don't always do, uh, the world will look as though there is a classical geometric structure. And so one wonders, well, if space and time emerges in this way, maybe that's where concrete objects are. But the thing is, uh, at the right energy scales, what that means is if you were to probe the system with more energy, that the quantumness of the geometry would show up again. It's not like it ever disappeared. It's just that we don't have empirical access to it. And so the claim is that the, if the claim is space time emerges at the classical regime, but if you were to probe it with higher energies, you would see the quantum effects. Then the question is, is it the case that at some energy scales, the table is concrete, but if you were to probe it a little bit more, it would also become abstract? You know, because now the quantum geometry is there, and you don't have the sort of spatial central structure that they thought. And so this is the worry that I have, is if you do this, you're, you're tying concrete objects to an energy scale. Which means if you probe it more concrete objects, which is here. But presumably, if it's a concrete or an abstract object, it's just independent of the tools by which we use to probe the world. Presumably, a concrete object just is independent of what energy sales humans can sense at. Presumably. If you want to work, now, it might be the case that you see an update our account of what the abstract concrete distinction amounts to. And maybe this is it. We have a deflated notion of that distinction. And maybe in that case, it really does just. Um, they are abstract at that lower level, and they and all we mean by concrete objects is when something looks concrete with respect to the or acts in a concrete way. So we have a sort of functionalist understanding of concrete objects. But then what we've done is just upgraded what we mean by that distinction, and you're playing the game that I think my position should do. We should play the game. And so yeah, there's a way to bring about it. I, it doesn't tie into my own intuitions about what this distinction should be, but we're all in it, but there's some options open to us. Right, I said I would do that. Thank you. No, thank you. I like that question. Carol. Hi. Um, so I suppose I'm, you know, a person who's 
fighting against you on number three on your first slide, I've got very thick kind of yeah. understanding of that physique. Um, I feel like you've just given me a reason to be dogmatic and to kind of not look to the physics because it keeps revising itself and changing its concepts. Yeah. So why wouldn't I just go off and... Yeah. And so let's, I would say, well, let's not look at the quantum gravity, let's just look at our intellectual history. You, if you're a metaphysician, keeps getting beat up. You keep thinking you have these items if you're a metaphysician, and you, you keep being wrong with respect to these items. What I want you to do is But even according to physics, uh, metaphysicians now don't believe that the eternal shape of the universe, uh, the orbits, are, are circular, essentially. And so they themselves have upgraded their metaphysics over time. And so the question is, a pure metaphysics puts themselves in a position, not that they should reject the physics, because the physics they agree has been helpful to them. They no longer believe in the internal shape of celestial orbits. What they should do is they should move closer into the quantity camp. At least, maybe not in a non-ontological sense, at least with respect to what they have epistemic access to. I don't know which, which parts are actually going to be pure. I'm going to put them at the center of my bed. I'm going to look to physics and see what doesn't jiggle over time. And I'm going to keep saying, my confidence that these are pure items in metaphysics. Um, I have confidence. I'm going to put them into the center of the web because I don't think they're going to jiggle much. And I'm just going to hold them provisionally. You know? So I, I'm going to say that the history, the intellectual history, forget quantum gravity and whatnot, the intellectual history of pure metaphysics should push you away from being dogmatic into a more so of a, a holistic, at least for practical purposes, uh, framework of looking at the relationship. So that's what I would say. You know, it's not the problem gravity that's not the problem. It's the whole intellectual history that's not the problem. So I have a question that follows up a little bit on that. So in a way, I think you have made claims of three different levels of generality that uh, one could resist. So the, the sort of the most universal claim was the claim about the, the three options you put on the table, the three different stances in, in metaphysics one could take, and how they all get um, uh, have to feel the heat of the physics one way or another, um, or, or have to, you know, Admit the claims eventually uh, that they put up. The, and then the, the second level was okay, let, to illustrate that, let's look at one more concrete example the example of the distinction between abstracta and concreta, and see how that fares uh, in you know, taking different stances, I guess, and then responding to quantum gravity in particular. And then at the more, more local level, you, you have the particular ways of making that distinction and how each one of them. Uh, runs into trouble. So I have questions about each of these three levels, so maybe I'll start at the top level and defer the rest for dinner. Uh, so suppose I'm one in, you know, a person in, in camp three, the pure metaphysics camp, as you call it, uh, and I just, maybe I'm not like kind of motivated by the fact that, you know, physics keeps changing, that I don't, you know, need to pay attention, but maybe I have even more principled reasons to think that I don't need pay attention. Maybe I'm really a metaphysician and I truly believe there's no relation between my sort of enterprise and what the people in the physics department do. And what, you know, so, so they have their empirical methods, they go to tests and experiments and observations, but me as a metaphysician in the philosophy department, I don't think I need to do any of that. My methods are purely a priori. And what I am in the business of discovering are necessary truths of the most fundamental reality, uh, level of reality of our world. Stuff that physics never gets at in principle. So whatever I do, and whatever they do in particular, it's not going to affect me because my methods yield necessarily true uh, you know, knowledge. The, the knowledge claims I'm making are necessary. They're found a priori. And so, so there's, I'm not going to change. Whatever they tell me, I'm not going to change. You're, you're the ideal, you're the ideal pure metaphysician. Uh, yes, yeah, exactly. Right. So how could somebody like that you know, be impressed by what you said? Well, I hope by my jolly disposition. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they would be with that. Yeah. What about the... Uh, so the argument is, 
Let's look at, let's do a pessimistic meta induction on your supposed methods. You say you have these supposed methods which yield a priori necessary truths, and let's see how well they fared in the history of our intellectual history. And I gave you four examples of where this happened. And I'm sure if we sat here with all of you, we could come with a dozen examples of where these, these methods that were supposed to give us pure, uh, a priori necessary truths came into conflict with the heat. Uh, physics. And so my claim is, is your methods don't work. You think they're giving you necessary truths, but the history, our intellectual history tells us they come into conflict with our physical theories. Go ahead. No, they're not. They're not. I, I, I resist that line of thought. You know, what physicists are doing, they are looking, but when they do you know, measurements involving relativistic uh, time dilation and things like that, they're, they're measuring or trying to find out what clocks do. Me as a metaphysician, I am investigating what time itself is like, not merely some sort of mechanical device that in some poor way and possibly imperfect way tracks uh, and mirrors the pure essence of time. Sure, yeah. Uh, I could imagine someone like Aristotle saying something similar. Uh, also, you know, these low-level astronomers are trying to figure out the speed of the celestial orbits. How fast are they moving? They're trying to see what are their, uh, their orientation with respect to the background stars. Are they moving like this with respect to this zodiac or that? They're finding like details of motion. I, Aristotle, am finding out the sort of basics of motion. What is essentially necessary for our experiences? What is the metaphysics of these objects which is independent of their motion, right? He could say something very similar, distinguishing himself from those low-level just mappers of stars and wandering planets. And we would say the same thing. Look, Aristotle thought he was doing this, and he failed. The sort of assumptions that he made ended up coming into conflict with the physics in the end. And while we think we're trying to discover what the nature of essence of time is, it's not as though our thesis ever comes with the label, by the way, what they're doing when they're what they're doing in the lab has nothing to do with me. It's not as though uh, our thesis about the world can tell us those things. We just assume it because it seems impossible to us that what they're doing in there can never touch on our questions. And I can say, many people have taken this position, right, of a pure metaphysician and said, I mean, look at Leibniz. Leibniz says, uh, here is any two objects which have all their properties are identical. I mean, try to think about counterexamples of that. You know, you have Fred and George Weasley. They both go to Hogwarts. They both have red hair. They both have a brother named Ron. They both all of a sudden share the same spatial temporal relations. Well, how are there two twins then? seems like there's just one thing, right? The Leibniz principle of identity of indiscernible. Whatever else we do, the physicist goes out and counts objects. Leibniz is concerned with the nature of identity of objects. And he was shown to come into conflict with, you know, with Paul McKenna. Who could have ever predicted that? And so who could ever predict what's happening in the lab when they're testing time to see how they're going to be forced to modify our conceptual structure to make sense of the experiments such that it affects what's happening with the metaphysician today. And so this is a roundabout answer. Uh, basically point to, again, examples in history. There are people that thought the same things and they were wrong. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Here's a question, yes? No, I don't have a question. I have a, well, perhaps yes. As a Buddhist metaphysician, uh, what you're doing, uh, I would call real world metaphysics. And uh, perhaps as you started correcting an error, I'll start uh, correcting uh, an error you may have, and that is that uh, Buddhism says that everything is an illusion. That's not at all true. Buddhism says that the wor uh, real world exists, and it is as it uh, appears to be, and, uh, but every possible idea that we have about that reality is pure, must be, remain purely speculative, because there, Everything is an illusion. And the idea of finding the truth, an absolute truth, is impossible because we have no uh, experience, direct experience with the real world. It all comes through this uh, filter of our illusions about it. Uh, now, how do you get around that? How, how do you get from perspective to the concrete? Well, you know, this, this 
this is, I'm not going to be able to answer it completely, but this has a, an intellectual history and analytic philosophy as well. So Kant thought you couldn't get to the noumena of the actual nature of the objects themselves, and so you have to stop something I'm sure. Uh, the Quinean doesn't think we ever get to absolute objective truth about the world, the holistic, the middle position. All you build is a system of conceptual relations that are uh, effective in getting you around the world, but there's no claim that there aren't competing systems that are doing equally well. So there's no claims of absolute truth in that system. So the analytic tradition uh, has some of these themes as well, and that's one of the options over there, the second option. Thank you. The best question in Chicago here. So actually, it's from the, it's from the way I So it's, you're the, you're the male of the student. I'm just gonna get this, okay. So you said, like, I have a question about uh, some presumptive metaphysician ready to bite the bullet. I guess he listened to the reply to Chris and was convinced. Uh, so the question is, how probabilistic should she be? Let us imagine that she's ready to take some lessons from quantum gravity or string theory or other theories in quantum gravity. Um, we have to admit that the idea of emergence of space time is rather different in uh, these theories. So some inconsistencies would pop out there, even the vehicles of these different theories relate differently to our space time and causation or energy as we know it. So the question can be boiled down to the inconsistencies between different uh, maybe, you know, abstract pre-relations. These different theories, I guess, these ideas might have different things to say about that. So, yeah, what well, I guess, I think, yeah, so where's the metaphysician supposed to go? Uh, or are they just going to be getting some images? Um, or is it her class? Is he going to be sort of the opposite of this question? Which of the theories is probably, is it her key? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So I'm going to, not in, Johan, uh, thanks for chiming in. and. Uh, usually, Johan and I are the only two on uh, doing the live streams. We do a little chat sometimes. Uh, anyways, uh, there's, there's five people watching. One on uh, I never. Uh, so you know, my so this is my this is my own suggestion to the man that is who's now bit the bullet. How is it that we use uh, quantum theories of gravity in theory of metaphysics, especially when we have different metaphysical, uh, different quantum theories that might be saying something different? We have different interpretations of even a single theory. We have uh, past this point, quantum mechanics itself pushes on our metaphysics. So how which which of these things do we use to actually incubate our big future metaphysics? In my mind, I am a sort of anarchist in the fire obvious sense. I say use as many as possible. You get as many tools. It's not like you're going to go build a house. You don't just take one tool with you. You take as many tools as possible. And you, and you, spend this, and you have to do some sort of energy conservation. You can't do everything at once. But work on this project to see if you can build a consistent, coherent whole using one interpretation of one theory, what the metaphysics looks like. Use another one, do that, and then follow your nose and follow what seems to be actually working out. And so I'd say uh, this is a little bit of a pragmatic answer, so do all of them as, or as much as you can and see, because it's always good to just have as many tools as possible. I don't think you need to choose one or the other. Okay, so. Yeah, I have another question. Um, so I was starting to think about this. Uh, okay, there is some weird feeling. Um, okay, we hear you fine. So I was thinking about kind of uh, the mathematical physical design, this thing that has been questioned by Tim Mark. And I myself am necessarily pretty bizarre and not at all attracted by his view. But it's, it's, uh, it, could be interesting to hear what you think about that because mathematical entities are pragmatically abstract. But he kind of thinks that all of them are physically instantiated or there is no real difference there. An alternative, more kind of saying view, would be something like not all mathematical entities or structures are physically instantiated, but only some. And uh, those mathematical structures can be very weird and very different from uh, traditional space and temporal picture. But one could still have something, have some kind of view, we just say some of them are physically instantiated. And that could somehow around the uh, concrete abstract distinction, in, in the sense that 
only the mathematical strict structures that has that kind of physical instantiation should be kind of used to uh, construct the concrete data, sort of thing. Sure. Uh, it's a case where I, where I guess I can't hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, Penelope Maddy also says some similar things is that there's certain sorts of abstract objects. Uh, which are in space and time, which are causal, I forget exactly the point, but it makes a similar problem uh, for a sort of straightforward distinction between abstract and concrete objects. Uh, I personally, what you're doing here is you're doing it's something that I think should be done. You know, given these sorts of uh, results in quantum gravity, what is it that we should be thinking about the nature of abstract and concrete objects? Maybe you're suggesting. Go ahead. And that was really actually specifically quantum gravity. Take one's choose. It's basically his own view, uh, even though he is a physicist, even though it's a very extravagant and physical view, it says all mathematical structures are meaningful. And, and, and so, so he didn't embrace the mathematical physical distinction. I find this to be solved, and I think there is some kind of uh, thing you can say, even though all mathematical entities are abstract, some of them correspond to something physical, or is in one in one. Corresponds to something physical, that is, they are physically instantiated, some of which are not. And that one can use that. And even if you don't have something like a traditional space map thing, say, the mathematical structures we work with in, in, in the various cultures of the family may or may not be physically instantiated. If they're physically instantiated, then that could be a basis for kind of finding concrete data, even though it will be different from the traditional. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think I understood your comment, and I think that I don't have anything in principle disagreeing with that this is a possible way that one might go taking time marks to do in the context of space and time and not being fundamental. I don't have anything to add to it other than that I think that this is good to do. This is a, a way that you're inclined to read tag mark less crazily uh, than the cool. I don't have anything to add to it, though. Unless you, unless you think that there's some conflict with some things that I've said that I'm missing. I'm not reading that I'm challenged. Yeah, but you want to, you want to. But it's, I, I, I think there is some kind of disconnect in the way you asked the question. Yeah, I, I, I took, we might need to move on, but I took you to be saying, look, we could go ahead and we could relate some abstract objects and say that they are somehow uh, physically instantiated and then you want to somehow save the distinction using this connection. Yeah. And uh, and so my question is, I guess I just got kind of lost then about how Tagmar relates to my project. Maybe you can tell me that. Okay. Uh, but maybe it doesn't really relate to the project. It's just that his his view is he he denies the physical mathematical distinction. Yep. And of course, the mathematical is very back and forth as abstract. Yep. And the physical is part of that and all of us. Yeah. Yeah. He denies that position. I, I don't know that. But I think one could, one could say this kind of abstract and concrete by thinking of physical instantiation. Either that can be a given or elaborate story about the mathematical and the physical means that it's kind of relevant. I'm not sure about that. It's possible. It might be that the physical means that it's kind of relevant. I'm not sure about that. It's possible. It might be best to be doing if thinking of that as kind of opinion. Uh, the physical instantiation. And it's not exactly the same you're talking about, it's kind of related to this yeah. Got it. I don't know whether this is helpful, but I take cases to be making the point that if somebody denies the linear distinction between abstract and the concrete objects, here's one response one would have to this person. And now it seems that if something along the same lines might be a response to you, who in a way may not in principle deny the distinction, but you know, come up with some sort of problem. So the question of whether something, some notion of physical instantiation, perhaps, or something like that, some thought some along these lines, might save, uh, might introduce a way to, to, to make that distinction. I mean, that's how I understand the case of the question. Is that fair? Yes. 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 
Okay, good. No, I, I, I totally agree that. Yeah, yeah, I think that similar thing, thing can be done there. I think that it would be done in terms of uh, causation, like I said before, those things which end up being causal or however it is you end up thinking about causation. Uh, but I think that that's fine. I think that one could end up doing that. All right. Uh, any short, urgent questions? Yes, we can also think we could have the reuse some of our tomato models to spec a lot of the human diseases that lose more than the human tools. Caso's project? Do you want to ask Caso? Or do you want to ask me? Many people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Caso, uh, you could answer that if you want. My thing is, I don't understand Caso's well enough to know how it will end up relating mathematical things to speculative whatever. In my mind, uh, everything is speculative. The nature of mathematics, all of the metaphysics, uh, it doesn't seem to be introducing any more weirdness in the world than I think there is weirdness. But let me go ahead and ask Keso if you think that this causes the problems for your view, Keso. Uh, I didn't quite hear what you said. Um, so if you use uh, uh, non instantiated mathematics to speculate in metaphysics that is necessarily false, as the structures are not instantiated. He's saying so, good. So the idea is that if we have a distinction between instantiated mathematics and uninstantiated mathematics, something like that, yeah. uh, I mean, what's the status then of the uninstantiated? Is that not you know pure, abstract, wonderful mathematics anymore, but instead lowly speculative metaphysics of their right to grade it somehow? And also necessarily false because there is yes. nothing in the world that corresponds to that. So necessarily false. Wow. Necessity in there. Yeah, I well, mean, but, but I would think, no, I don't think it's very extreme to have a view where I have to say that in someone's day, it is all the mathematical uh, entities are abstract. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying there is, for some of them, there are corresponding concrete. And I think his point is these abstract things, do we want to also give them the status of strange speculative metaphysics? Do we want to give no, them this label? Yeah, I don't think so, because you have another beautiful things about mathematics to keep that. Keep that. So, so I'm uh, okay. so I'm going to that speculative metaphysics. Sure. Okay, so thanks for answering my question. question. I didn't want to have to do that. So Nick, thank you. Nick. I take it you'd be saying, saying well, well, they'd be less speculative if, if they were paying, paying attention to modern physics, and that's, that's not my point. point. I don't, don't take uh, Leibniz to be a speculative metaphysician or necessarily Aristotle from being a speculative metaphysician. I'm taking someone uh, that Chris was representing earlier in the day 
uh, where he thinks no matter what happens in the physical world, I could do metaphysics, come what physics may. Uh, I'm addressing this person as the, uh, of course he's parodying. I'm addressing this as the metaphysical uh, speculative. Now, the objection to myself is none of us actually sit in a physics vacuum. None of us actually shut the door and close the window. Our whole upbringing and the way that we conceive the world is informed by the physical education we're given. Uh, and so I take it to be the case, I take your point to be right, there actually is no pure speculative metaphysician. And that point I'm happy with. Okay. Nick, did I get to your point? Yeah, Thank you. You're, you train me well. Okay, I, I think we have to end here on this note. So please join me in thanking Josh again. Thank you people in Chicago.